of this has been his life, uh, much of which he has himself introduced, put together, and we are honored that we have him tonight in Mendham to tell us about these organizations and what he knows about the Revolutionary War. Harry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody and uh, commend what you're doing in Mendham. You know, if, if uh, all towns uh, had the spirit that you folks did right here, uh, we'd have more and more people following through on history, which is so exciting. And so much of it took place right here. And I want to tell you tonight about the Civil War Roundtable, the American Revolution Roundtable, and the Washington Association, which are three very uh, dominant and exciting organizations right here and everybody can reach out and attend the meetings and enjoy the same uh, success that we have had. But uh, let me go back to the beginning. Uh, I was uh, nothing more than just a guy playing golf and uh, I'm no historian and I'm sure many of you are far more versed than I am. And I ran into a guy named Bob Buerhaus. We have met right here in Mendham, Mendham Golf and Tennis Club, and uh, he lured me into going to Virginia during the winter to play golf. And we got down there, and uh, he was a Civil War buff. So we would play golf in the morning and then go to a Civil War battlefield in the afternoon. And after going to about three or four of these uh, battlefields, I became sort of hooked myself. And what fascinated me was that uh, the tremendous battles and the loss of life. And the more I learned about the Civil War of 624,000 men going down, uh, the, more than all of our other wars put together. And it, it intrigued me. So uh, Bob and I uh, suddenly uh, found a way to go and visit Western Civil War battlefields. And while we were there and out in Shiloh and, and Vicksburg, we were in the company of a West Pointer who uh, happened to be the president of the uh, Sacramento, California Civil War Roundtable. And he said, you know, you guys ought to start something back in Morristown. So we came back, and it was more incumbent upon me to do it uh, than Bob, although he was my partner and, and uh, uh, a very special guy and, and uh, still is today. But we started. We went around, and we started it right at the Morristown Club. So just all of this history that we're going to talk about tonight, first of all, was Mendham Golf and Tennis Club and Morristown, the Morristown Club. And we wound up with 13 people at our first meeting in 2002. And one of them is here tonight, and uh, Dick Florsheimer, who uh, was recruited by Bob Buerhaus. They sang in a, uh, a barbershop quartet together. And, uh, uh, so the next thing, uh, I think, Dick, you and I are about the only two around with Buehler House. Everybody else is gone. But we started then, and our first meeting was in 2003. And word of mouth, and uh, all I can tell you is that uh, I was the president for the first few years. And then Dick Florsheimer was president. And now Rich Rosenthal is brilliantly carrying on as president. And this Civil War roundtable uh, we feel is uh, without question one of the top three Civil War roundtables in the country. Our last meeting last Thursday night was just fantastic. Over 70 people were there and uh, uh, we get that sort of crowd every time and uh, it's very, very exciting. We meet uh, at the, uh, the Freelingheisen Arboretum. Uh, Rodney Freelingheisen uh, suggested we meet there and thanks to Rich's persistence, uh, we're still there. And it, it's just uh, something that if, if you have a free night, it's the fourth uh, Thursday of every month, with the exception of April, I think, right, which we have. But other than that, there it is at, at the Freelingheisen Arboretum, and you'll meet great people just like yourselves uh, and hear great speakers. So uh, anyway, that, uh, uh, of course, got me uh, involved. And before you know it, I was spending a lot of time and and met all of these folks who are with me tonight. They're all key players in the Civil War.
and I'll get into the American Revolution Roundtable shortly. But first, uh, let me uh, stay with the Civil War because uh, that, as I say, was just so tremendous. I, I, I keep on thinking uh, of, of watching Channel 13, which a lot of us do, and uh, so often they say, we'll end the program tonight with, uh, in, in silence as we honor 10 men who have lost their lives. And you compare that in a nation where today we're 320 million people compared to those days when the country didn't go far beyond the Mississippi River, with an exception here and there, and the total population was 31 million, not 320 million. And they suffered losses of 624,000 men during that terrible, terrible conflict. So it, it's just uh, uh, stayed with me all the time. And I want to now have you join me on a little journey. And I'm going to take you through some of the great battles and the great leaders of the Civil War. And we're going to start with a Confederacy at Bull Run. <clears throat> and the two great leaders at that particular battle, which whomped the Union. The Union went in to end the war, they thought, very quickly. And they ran into two commanders named Pierre Beauregard and Joseph Johnston. And uh, if it wasn't for the fact that the Confederacy wasn't trying to uh, win property at that time, they could have marched right into Washington, but they didn't. They just beat the heck out of the Union. And these two generals, Beauregard and Johnson, stayed on <clears throat> throughout the war as key leaders of the uh, Confederacy. They, they were leaders in the West, and they wound up at the very end. Joseph Johnson had the last army uh, coming up from the South that the Lee was hoping to go down and join that uh, he was beaten and he couldn't do. And Beauregard, who started in Charleston, <clears throat> when he, uh, he was the man that got Fort Sumter to sur uh, surrender, he was still the commander uh, in that area at the end of the war. They were just outstanding generals. Now, uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> the campaigns that followed the uh, Peninsula Campaign, Johnston got hurt and was replaced by Robert E. Lee. I don't need to tell you uh, about Lee. Probably one of the great, great generals. And he just won every single battle in those early days of the war throughout Virginia. And one of his key lieutenants, of course, was Stonewall Jackson. And one of the tragedies for the Confederacy was that uh, after they won the uh, Battle of Chancellorsville, uh, Jackson went out to do some uh, uh, reconnaissance and came back and uh, uh, somebody from the North Carolina uh, regiment there uh, didn't know that it was Jackson and, and shot at him and killed him. And that was a critical loss that Lee uh, said he never found another Stonewall Jackson. But his other great general was uh, Pete Longstreet. And he stayed with Lee throughout the war and uh, was with him uh, uh, at, at uh, Gettysburg. and to the time he uh, surrendered. And he was very critical of, of uh, Robert E. Lee afterward for some of his tactics, but uh, nonetheless, he was another principal general. And the one <clears throat> that is one of my favorites is Jeb Stuart. And I don't know if any of you have been to uh, Richmond, but uh, down there they have Monument Avenue. And this is, here was the capital of the uh, Confederacy. And right at the end of, uh, uh, there's a marvelous, a uh, statue of uh, Jeb Stuart on his horse rising up. And uh, this young man uh, was the first great cavalry leader in both armies. And uh, at the beginning, he actually rode around the Union armies twice. They couldn't stop him. And he was the uh, great star for the Confederacy. And of course, eventually, as the Union built up its own cavalry, uh, he was con uh, killed at Yellow Tavern but nevertheless, one of the great Southern generals. Going on, Rich Ewell, one of Lee's principal men who rode with him the entire war as a corps commander. John Gordon, a young fireball from Georgia. And uh, what is significant about him was that at the very end, when Lee almost couldn't continue the war, they decided to have one more crack and break out, and they picked John Gordon, to make that raid against the 
Union forces, but he was frustrated and defeated by Ord and uh, little Phil Sheridan. But again, a great general. Going on, A.P. Hill and D.H. Hill, not brothers. They were significant generals uh, during the war, and, and uh, I bring them up because they weren't brothers, uh, but uh, they were uh, one of Lee's closest Confederates. Then uh, we have uh, Fitzhugh Lee, who was Robert E. Lee's nephew and worked principally with Stonewall Jackson, and uh, especially in Chancellorsville. And he stayed throughout the war and was one of the two Confederate generals that stayed on and became a member, regular member of the United States Army, one of the two that survived as a Confederate general. Stephen Lee was a brilliant general for the South, and I mention him only because he was one of the few that was not related to Robert E. Lee. And uh, we're going on, and I'll bring out the rest of the family very shortly. But of course, Pickett. We've all heard about Pickett's charge. And he was a, a, a general that you've heard about, and he actually operated under Longstreet, and he made that famous charge at uh, uh, Gettysburg that failed. And the great story is when he came back, Lee said, reform your uh, division in the rear. And he said, what division? They're all gone. Of course, there was 50,000 men that were killed that weekend. Lou Armistead was a very interesting guy for me. He went to West Point, and when he was a plebe there, uh, and being uh, disciplined as the West Pointers do with plebes, he got ticked off one day, and he took a plate and broke it over the head of Jubal Early and was thrown out of the academy. However, he came back. He was an Army person, and he came back and rejoined the Army, and his talents were recognized, and he served out West and uh, under uh, Hancock and uh, uh, made his way. And then, of course, when the uh, split came and the Confederacy left the Union, he went with the Confederacy. And uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg, he proceeded farther up the hill than anybody else. He came up to the almost the very top before he fell on a, the last cannon and was killed. And before he died, he said, Please tell Hancock I almost made it back to him. Uh, he was some special guy. John Magruder, uh, during the Battle of uh, uh, the Peninsula, was the leader of the Confederate forces. And he had difficulties with uh, the president of the Confederacy and wound up being sent to Texas. And he ran and was the chief Confederate commander in Texas. and. Uh, that whole area for the balance of the war. Wade Hampton, uh, after uh, uh, Jeb Stewart was killed, they had to try to uh, decide who was they were going to replace him with. And it was either Hampton or Lee's son, Rooney Lee. And they picked Wade Hampton. And of course, you've heard of Hampton, Virginia. Well, that's where the name comes from. And he was a brilliant cavalry officer for the uh, Confederacy, the Battle of the War. And there's this Jubal Early that I told you about before that had uh, uh, a plate on his head. He uh, was a very uh, tenacious commander, and at the end of the war came and threatened Washington very, very seriously, and Lee had to send uh, members of the cavalry uh, uh, up there uh, in a hurry, uh, Phil Sheridan and, and uh, uh, Lou Wallace, to keep Washington from being taken. This is despite the fact that Grant was pressing Lee on the other part of the Virginia front. But he was a famous Civil War, uh, of course, general. Now, I mentioned Rooney Lee, one of Lee's sons. He had another son. Rooney Lee, by the way, was really the third leading cavalry general of the Confederacy. And his brother, Custis Lee, was in charge of all of the defenses around uh, 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 Richmond. So Lee had two sons and a nephew uh, in the war, uh, and, and people always ask, what part of his family fought? Well, there you, there's your answer. Uh, two sons and a nephew. Now, out west, we haven't touched there yet because the first part of the war, of course, caught everybody's attention. It was in Virginia. But out west, the 
<coughs> Confederacy relied on a man named Albert Sidney Johnston, no relationship to Joseph Johnston, and a great favorite of uh, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. The great, first great battle that they had early in the war was at Shiloh, where 23,000 men, by the way, went down. And Johnson got uh, hit, and they couldn't stop the bleeding. And here was a commanding officer of the all Western forces, and he died. He was uh, one of the many generals that were killed in combat. And uh, he was replaced at that time of all people by Beauregard, who was sent out there. But other great men of the West for the Confederacy was <coughs> Bragg uh, and, and John Bell Hood. Bragg uh, was uh, uh, very close to uh, uh, the president, Jefferson Davis, but not an effective commander. And uh, when I was uh, in my travels, everybody that I ran into who was a Confederate uh, person uh, gave him the thumbs down. But John Bell Hood was an interesting man. He uh, lost a leg at uh, Gettysburg, and then he also uh, uh, had a, an arm uh, was uh, cut off, and they had to uh, uh, tie him into the saddle. It was minus a leg and minus, minus an arm, but he uh, was probably one of the most exciting commanders because at the very end, he led that army that he was determined to take it west and go up to Canada and keep the, uh, keep the Union from winning the war. Uh, of course, he failed. He got destroyed at uh, Nashville. An interesting thing about him, uh, he uh, was pretty good in the horizontal position at night. He had 11 children, even without an arm and a leg. The, uh, Joe Wheeler, fighting Joe Wheeler, uh, I tell you, was a great, great, again, another a, a wonderful uh, cavalryman for the uh, Confederacy. Bill Hardy wrote the uh, book on inf wrote the infantry book at West Point, and of course it points out the depth that the Confederacy had of senior officers when this war started. Uh, they all from the South, including Robert E. Lee, left to go back the Confederacy. As you know, Lee was offered the job of commanding general of Union forces and turned it down and instead went back to uh, Virginia. He said, I can't, I, I can't fight against m my state. One of the most famous generals, uh, Forrest, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the great raider. And uh, uh, he, he led a series of uh, generals for the Confederacy uh, that w whenever the North was shipping a supply train or there was reserves going up, they would be attacked by Forrest, and he was just irreplaceable and uh, unstoppable. And uh, one of the great generals, and by the way, after the war, was the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, John Hunt Morgan was one of his deputies who was captured, put in prison in Ohio, escaped, came back, and did the same great damage that, uh, that Forrest did and these other uh, great raiders for the uh, Confederacy. Earl Van Doren and Leonidas Polk, Polk being a, a, a bishop, but they were great commanders for the, uh, uh, for the Confederacy. Out in uh, the West, John Pemberton, who was a boy from, a uh, young man from Pennsylvania, and he was the commanding general at Vicksburg. That Van, what Grant did was uh, they surrounded Vicksburg and had two terrific battles, and Grant said, we're, we're, it's going to be so hard to <clears throat> win this battle without an incredible loss of life. So he starved them out. He uh, had the whole place surrounded, and there was no aircraft in those days. And after 30 days, Pemberton, Pemberton and 10,000 men surrendered to Grant. Breckinridge. You've heard of Breckinridge, Kentucky. He was the Secretary of War for the Union until the war came out. He went back and uh, was a great general and uh, was significant at the very end when Jefferson Davis was fleeing for his life and, and, and left Richmond and took money and everything. He also had Breckinridge with him and he was captured down in Georgia along with uh, uh, Jefferson Davis. Bushrod Johnson, we're getting to the end of, the command of these generals, <coughs> 
But uh, the man who took us on our Western tour was a uh, Confederate uh, advocate, and uh, Bushrod, uh, uh, he told me, was one of the great generals. So I put him in one of my list of, of, of outstanding men. Richard Taylor and Kirby Smith were generals down in Mobile and uh, that south se uh, section close to Texas and uh, uh, th with uh, uh, John Magruder. And finally, Patrick Clareburn, a young man from uh, Ireland who uh, came to this country and uh, uh, was called the uh, Stonewall Jackson of the West. And he was another one of the men who was killed, uh, one of the many generals. Three other uh, generals were Sterling Price, who did a great job as a raider, and before that had done, he was an older man compared to many of these young men in their 30s, and he had invaded against the Indians in, down in New Mexico and Arizona, and he tried to r round up support for the Confederacy, but of course when the war ended, that state stopped that. And Ben Cheatham was a uh, great general who served under uh, John Bell Hood, but he too was killed in the Battle of Franklin, and uh, one of the six generals, by the way, who was killed in that great battle. And lastly, uh, Lafayette McLaws, I picked him out because he uh, stayed throughout the war as a major general for the uh, Confederacy. He was a cousin of Richard Taylor, who fought down uh, with uh, Kirby Smith. And that finishes the 37 generals uh, that I have considered the leading generals for the Confederacy. Now back up to the Union, you got to get the Union. And they started out with great problems because McDowell was their first general who lost that first battle to uh, Beauregard. And they sent him back to Minnesota. McClellan, of course, was a famous general, and I always amused me. Uh, he was, uh, drove Lincoln crazy. He said McClellan had the slows. He wouldn't attack. He insisted on training the army. And one night, uh, uh, Lincoln went, down to, went out to see him and went to his camp and was sitting down in the downstairs of this house where Mc, had McClellan had his headquarters. McClellan came in the back door, went upstairs, and sent word down to, next, to Lincoln that it was inconvenient for him to see him and uh, he uh, would see him the next morning. And Lincoln, of course, got ticked naturally at left. But Pope and Burnside and Hooker were all great men at the beginning. Uh, Pope lost uh, the, uh, uh, badly to Robert E. Lee. Burnside, Fredericksburg, got slaughtered. And Hooker, of course, got beaten at Chancellorsville. Then, of course, came uh, <coughs> the war started to change. And when we got to uh, the great battle at the, George Meade became the commanding general of the Union forces at Gettysburg. And his uh, great lieutenants that helped him during those days, Chamberlain, Hancock, little Phil Sheridan, the great cavalryman, uh, Gouverneur Warren, Dan Sickles, and John Buford, who stopped the uh, Confederates during the first day uh, when they uh, came so close to winning Gettysburg. John Sedgwick was a great general who uh, was a favorite of everybody in the Union Army. And uh, after winning many battles, he uh, got to an area and they said, General, you please watch it. Uh, you know, you're exposing yourself. He said, I don't need to worry about it. And with that minute, a shot came and killed him. And he was one of the many generals that went down. Phil Kearney was a great general during uh, the early part of the war, and of course, that's where Kearney, New Jersey comes. Banks. Now, he was one of the interesting generals that Lincoln had to take because uh, the, uh, uh, he wasn't a West Pointer, but it was, he was a political general. And uh, he fought the war and uh, was not highly regarded, but he certainly existed and, uh, and, and won the great last battle that cleared the uh, Mississippi River. Custer, uh, of course, of uh, fame when, when he got killed by the Indians, but he was a young cavalryman that served uh, uh, under uh, Phil Sheridan. General Ord, of which uh, Fort Ord was named, and Ord's son was uh, chief of staff to MacArthur in, in the Philippines in the 30s. But he, uh, Ord, was the commanding general 
at the end of the Army of the James uh, when they cut off Lee from uh, tr escaping down to try to meet with uh, uh, Johnson down in, in uh, uh, the Carolinas. Logan was another uh, general who, probably the best one of the political generals, and fought with Grant along the way. Pleasanton started the uh, comeback of the uh, Union forces as a cavalryman and, uh, uh, and, and was exceptional during the war. Fitzhugh Porter was another outstanding general who unfortunately at the very end got court-martialed. Now we haven't mentioned Grant and Sherman and Thomas. I don't need to say anything about Grant and Sherman because they're of course the great generals you know about them. George Thomas, uh, the uh, uh, Rock of Chickamauga where he stopped uh, uh, B uh, Braxton Bragg and, and before Grant came in and then turned it around and won uh, Chattanooga. Uh, but uh, then Thomas destroyed John Bell Hood when he came north uh, at the Battle of Franklin and the Battle of Nashville. Slocum, Howard uh, were outstanding generals who rode with Grant out in the west. Halleck, of course, started in the west and was a great manipulator and wound up getting himself appointed as general in chief in Washington and they all reported to him. What was uh, uh, interesting was when Grant was so successful at the end and became the first lieutenant general at that time, he left Halleck in place in Washington and instead decided to go and uh, run affairs behind uh, the Army of the Potomac uh, in uh, Virginia. And of course, he told Meade, where Lee goes, you will go. And he was right behind him, and he didn't want to get into Washington politics. So uh, where he used to report to Halleck, Halleck reported to him. Sort of an interesting. Uh, Don Carlos Buell uh, was an outstanding general, won some battles in Kentucky. Rosecrans, Schofield uh, were uh, successful Union generals. Butler, you've heard about Ben Butler. He was another political general and uh, the great story in New Orleans where he said something about the girls, if they didn't treat his generals correctly, they would be known as ladies of the night and a sort of nonsense. But he uh, later became, uh, I think, governor of, of Massachusetts after the war. Canby was a great leader facing uh, uh, the Confederacy down in Texas. And otherwise, there was a young general named McPherson who Grant and Sherman felt was going to be really succeed them in greatness, and he was killed just outside of Atlanta. McLaren tried to bypass Grant. He went to Lincoln, and uh, in those days, he's another political general, and Grant found out about it and eventually uh, uh, took his command away from him. And finally, Wilson. Who uh, uh, he was the man who captured uh, uh, Jefferson Davis. Now there's a few others that I do want to mention. Uh, Sam Curtis, who won the great Battle of Pea Ridge early in the war, is very important down in Louisiana. John Reynolds, who they really wanted to succeed uh, Hooker and become commanding general of the Union Army, he turned him down. That's when Meade got the job. And during the second day, when he got up, he was a very good general. He stood with John Buford at Gettysburg, and a sniper killed him right on the spot. Hugh Kilpatrick was a great cavalry leader. Lou Wallace, who wrote Ben-Hur. He was the one, as I mentioned before, who stopped uh, Jubal early outside of Washington. Joseph Revere, right here from, in Morristown, uh, was a uh, uh, good general, but again got court-martialed at the end, uh, and, uh, but Lincoln, throughout the court-martial, but uh, he, he was a local boy. Jesse Reno, uh, my friend in the West, uh, was his favorite general. He got killed during the war, and of course Reno, Nevada is named after him. And finally, uh, from Vermont, Grenville Dodge, the great, great engineer who uh, led that division of the Union Army and later was chief engineer for the North, Northern Pacific Railroad. And you can't end anything about the Civil War without mentioning Admiral Farragut and Admiral Porter. So all of that adds up to 80 great commanders, and you'll never have to worry about anybody doing it again, uh, but uh, these were the men uh, that were significant leaders in the greatest war that this country
had to uh, endure. We uh, were successful, and, and, uh, and, and this uh, Civil War roundtable made its mark. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the guys said, hey, let's start another one, the American Revolution Roundtable. After all, this is where right here in Morristown. And as Wirtz remembers, we got, and Dick, uh, we got John Cunningham, the great uh, historian, to uh, agree to appear <laughs> at a meeting in his hometown, and 150 people showed up. I mean, it was amazing. And uh, so we started off the American Revolution Roundtable, and we had our meetings right down here at the, uh, uh, en route to uh, Morristown from uh, Mendham. There's that road uh, uh, that goes high up, uh, uh, tremendous. Culture Center. Culture Center. The Cultural Center. That's where we held all the meetings as we were finishing uh, doing, uh, completing the great work on our uh, auditorium in uh, 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 at Washington's headquarters. So that's where we met for a couple of years. Or at least, yeah, well, I think it was a couple of years. And then finally, uh, the Washington headquarters opened up and we meet there. And by the way, the president of the uh, North Jersey American Revolution Roundtable is Gene Chabon, right here. Gene Forsheimer. <laughs> and uh, uh, so the Forsheimers are very special. Uh, I mean, you've got Dick, uh, president mm -hmm. of the Civil War Roundtable, and Gene, president of the American Revolution. Now, and by the way, at all our meetings, one of the highlights is that at the end of the meeting, Dick Florsheimer gets up and has a Q&A, which is just so enjoyable. And everybody just waits uh, to have uh, these questions asked. And the man to uh, 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 Dick's right is one of the great men who has super knowledge. He's not allowed to participate because he knows all the answers. But uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, these are great people that of help make these two roundtables what they are. So the American Revolution Roundtable has now, uh, we have uh, quite often uh, somewhere close to 100 people Four, at a meeting. Double, double, double that, 200. Um, Almost, we're gonna hit 200. Uh, oh, oh, oh yeah, membership. Yeah, sure. yeah oh, right, membership is 200. But at the meetings, oh, we oh. have 80 to 100 people. It's, and, and, and we're about the largest, uh, not about, we feel we're the largest no, we round table in the country and it's so here we are with, with this great uh, civil war and this uh, now this american revolution round table and that is the second thursday of every month and if you go there you'll meet great people just like yourself and and uh, you'll enjoy and uh, uh, listen to dick give his q a and one of the reasons why we've been sort of successful is that uh, with rosenthal leading the way is before we have any speaker, we always case him out. We don't accept anybody just being a speaker because quite often you get wonderful uh, professors who do nothing but read it all off. And so every one of our speakers are pretty good. And uh, you've got to have that in, toward, in order to grow. Now the American Revolution Roundtable, and I've got to be careful on time here. I started at 8 o'clock. Uh, so we're going to keep this uh, short. but. What can you say uh, except that George Washington was such a force? I uh, studied uh, Washington since I became president of the, of the first round table, which Jeannie has now taken my place. But without George Washington, uh, it's a question of whether we would ever have won the war. Uh, here, when you stop to think of it, the British deposited 50,000 trained people with all the supplies in their navy and the Hessians and, and, and we were a group of farmers and, and uh, uh, men who uh, took up arms to uh, become the uh, Continental Army and uh, were mistreated as far as uh, getting supplies. I mean, they didn't have the proper weapons. They had no clothing. They went through these terrible winters and how they ever endured. And George Washington kept the forces together. And uh, it, it was just amazing that he gave up nine years of his life. I, it, it really uh, shakes me when I see this. Nine years. He never went back to Mount Vernon while he was commanding general. Now his wife did come up and granted stay with him some of these winters. But he never went home uh, during that, those nine years. Nine years that he won our very freedoms that we enjoy today. So I have a, uh, just a, a couple of quick things I'd 
like to read, and with all due respect to Russ and Shirley, who have heard this before, because they're, hey, by the way, Russ Buchanan's my oldest friend and just had serious surgery and came tonight. He's a special guy, I want you to know. But uh, the, uh, after they uh, had won the war, Washington picked uh, Fonce's Tavert to have one last meeting with those officers that had been with him for nine years. And I'm, I'm reading from the book that uh, Ron Cherno wrote, which is a Pulitzer Prize, but he said, when Wa Washington strode into their midst in his blue and buff uniform, they rose and he helped them heap their plates and then they passed wine out of breathless silence and Washington began to speak, his voice breaking with emotion. He said, with a heart filled with love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. And the officers moved, lifted their glasses and drank, tears welled up in their eyes, and then Washington asked them to please come by and he wanted to touch each one of them and because he would not see them again. And then suddenly he went down and got in his carriage and it took him down to the water. He's, this is in New York City and he's on his way to New Jersey and back down on his triumphal trip to New Vernon, Mount Vernon, where he thought he was going to spend the rest of his life, but he didn't. Uh, he had to come up and play an integral part of uh, uh, getting a constitution established. And then when they came to having a first president, there was only one man that had the confidence of the country, and he came back and served another eight and a half years as president. So when you think of somebody who has given so much to our, our country, uh, I, I, I just uh, can't get over uh, what he meant. But uh, his fortitude in keeping the impoverished Continental Army intact was a major historic accomplishment. It always stood on the brink of dissolution and Washington was the one figure that kept it together, the spiritual and managerial genius of the whole enterprise. He had been resilient in the face of every setback, courageous in the face of every danger. He was that rare general who was great between battles and not just during them. The constant turnover of his army meant he, he continually had to start from scratch in training his men, blending troops from different states into a func functioning national force despite deep ideological fears of a standing army. So it was just, uh, uh, there wasn't a time during the war when Washington didn't grapple with a crisis, crisis that threatened to dismantle, abandon the army and abort the revolution. And uh, uh, so uh, because of time constraints tonight, I, I'm not going to go anything further except uh, I encourage you all to come to the uh, American Revolution Roundtable meetings, just like I do for the uh, Civil War Roundtable. I had uh, a part in starting both of them, and of course these great people have been with me, and uh, and and uh, we hope to see you there. Now I can't stop tonight, however, without telling you about the Washington Association, and. That's the granddaddy of it all. That's where the, this all started. And the Washington Association started in 1874. And it was three men who learned that the Ford Mansion uh, was going to be sold or turned or torn down because uh, Colonel Ford had died. And uh, they put together their resources and bought it. And uh, Shortly after they had it, of course, uh, the war and uh, General Washington needed a place for his staff to stay. And it was, it's a unique situation. I don't know how many of you, maybe you've all visited and taken the tour. If you haven't, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. And uh, the, Mrs. Ford and her children were there, and the Washington, his staff was there, and Mrs. Washington, she was there. But uh, it's a uh, very, very special place. But these men didn't just stop with the Washington's headquarters. Uh, they then went and uh, Mr. Smith was his name and he somehow secured all of the great documents that Washington and his staff had held during the war and today are, is the principal library of uh, the National Park Service, the Morristown National Historic Park and 
And if you ever take the tour down there, you'll see we have our uh, uh, one gallery uh, that, that concentrates on, uh, on those great documents. Um, and, but they, they secured those. The next thing they did, they uh, went out and they bought the land, uh, which is now Jockey Hollow uh, and, and uh, Fort Nonsense, and it was 1,700 acres. And all of this was the Washington Association of New Jersey. And uh, uh, they, uh, in the, about 1930, when things were very, very serious, obviously, in the Depression, uh, the government, uh, the Department of Interior, started the National Park Service. And the first National Historic Park is here at Morristown, right here. That's it. And uh, that's where it started. And it's, uh, uh, today we have, uh, uh, they started to have people become stockholders. It's sort of... Uh, uh, very emotional, and today we have over 600, or about 600 stockholders, and uh, it goes all the way back to Woodrow Wilson and William Howard Taft, up to Tom Kane and uh, Christy Whitman and uh, uh, some of us. Uh, and uh, we work. I'm now president of the Washington Association, and we're working hard to build a final museum. And uh, what we're, uh, this is going to be called the Discovery History Center, and uh, it's going to be an innovative museum. And uh, what we learned last year is they're teaching less and less about Washington every year, and children are not learning about the great deeds that he did to save this country. And so we're going to have this Discover History Center where children and older people too can go and learn about what these great men and women did in their day to create the country that we have today. So uh, uh, I'm just uh, very excited about that. And I brought with me uh, just some uh, books that I, you might be interested, the last uh, annual report. And it uh, points out uh, some of the great speakers that we've had in the 138 years that the uh, Washington Association of Jersey has, has functioned. And we're the ones right now, we're partners with the National, Par uh, National uh, Park uh, Service, but we raise the money. Uh, they run it, of course, th that was the agreement. All of the government insisted on owning the land. We raise the money and, and uh, it'll be for this new museum and anything we do. Uh, it's a unique partnership of government and private industry. And I spend every day down there to keep off the streets and it's been a, a real, uh, it's been a real uh, uh, challenge to me, and uh, I've enjoyed every minute. So I want to finish up by just saying that uh, these, uh, you people here are, are examples of, of interest in history. But just think of the thousands of people in this area who never take advantage. I, I meet people all the time, and I mention the Washington Association. They give me that sort of funny look. They, They'd never heard of it before. And uh, so we're uh, working hard to uh, make sure that people do learn about it. And uh, we uh, have got our round tables. And by the way, the uh, relationship with the National Park Service is getting better and better. As a matter of fact, they are now co-sponsoring our monthly meetings with the uh, American Revolution Roundtable. So that's a, a partnership there. And. Uh, uh, all in all, uh, for those of you who enjoy history, uh, I encourage you to come down and go to our meetings and tell your friends about it and uh, help us to keep building in the future. Thanks, everybody. I have questions. Yeah, sure. And if I can't answer them, I'll come over here and ask us. <laughs> what is a political general? Versus like a West Point. Oh, uh, well, during the war, uh, during the Civil War, uh, Lincoln faced the problem uh, that certain uh, politicians, first of all, they needed men, desperately. Yeah. And uh, so they had uh, uh, these political men who were uh, either governor or something, who uh, they encouraged to uh, gather up around them a regiment uh, or, uh, you know, uh, of men hundreds or thousands of men and of course they they had to uh, Lincoln felt he had to name them as general because they insisted on it and uh, 
it was very contentious between the West Point generals and those generals who were not West Point, but, but had uh, formed uh, uh, people around. Now, can you add to that uh, about the political well, generals? They were, uh, for the most part, had absolutely no, no military experience. Yeah, no, no military experience. And yet they were put in charge of all these men, and the, some disasters occurred. Yes. Were, but were, they, they recruited them. Yeah, but yeah. they recruited the men, yeah. right. and, and uh, they recruited the men. And that's what I mean. This Logan, I think, was the best of the bunch. The Lincoln felt because they had such an affinity with the men in the area and raised the men to join the army that he had to put them yeah. as, as generals. And, uh, and Harry, it's yeah. part of it was that uh, Lincoln's administration being Republican, yeah. he was looking for Democratic support. Many of the political generals were Democrats. Right. There you are. There's another very good answer. That's probably the best, thank you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Mr. Smith. I connect him with a man that owned Bill Barton. It was 5,000 acres, and he may have been the transformer. It, he could very well be, and I, uh, uh, Gene, do you know more, as much as, or more than I do, but. How did it become a. But, but he became, uh, uh, he was the man somehow that uh, had a relationship that secured all of these documents, and uh, which are the basis of our, our library, and uh, uh, and he was part of he was a key part of the Washington, one of the top three men, and and by the way he also in addition to those documents he was the key player in securing the land of well, Jockey that's, Hollow. That's exactly what. Right? Yeah. He has a lot of land. Oh yeah. I wondered what he did for a living or if he was, was he was a stockbroker. But he was in the right place stock. at the right time. They said he was a stockbroker. Stock stock yeah. Well, there you are. There you are. <laughs> he, he, uh, he lived in Florham Park. Yeah. Oh, he did. Yes. And we live in his orchard. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. And he had a few. Uh, he had a huge uh, mm. place there. He donated uh, the land for Jockey Hollow. He donated a lot of money to Drew University. Uh, oh, on and on and on. He do donated in our town all the uh, property for all the, the two churches and three churches in town. Uh, he was just a fabulous guy, and he he lived by himself. He was kind of a recluse. Yeah. And but he he at a time when nobody was picking up all of these important papers and uh, letters and everything, he managed somehow well, to just acquire a whole lot of them. He had a special safe in the basement of his home, and he kept boxes and boxes. You could almost fill half of this room with the boxes of documents that he has. Had. And he donated them to the, uh, the museum behind Washington's headquarters with the stipulation that they not be opened until 50 years after his death. Yes. And uh, so now they're going through them. And they find letters from George Washington and uh, yeah. the, the Adamses and uh, on and on and on. There's a letter there from uh, uh, Hamilton to uh, Aaron Burr. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, he was just a fabulous, fabulous man. Can you give me a year, approximately, about when this may have all transit took place? Well, he died in the 1956. 50, about 56. Yeah, and, and the Park Service and the merger with the Park Service and the Washington was 1930 okay. or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. So it was in uh, subsequent to uh, that. Uh, well, I, I think he had secured all of this before then, but he turned it over. Uh, we're going to build uh, uh, homes or something in Jockey Hollow. Hollow. Real estate development. Yeah. And he Real. stopped that. And he stopped, he stopped that. Yeah, Realizing the importance yeah. hysteric, historically of, the, uh, of this land. Quite the guy. And his name was John Smith? No. Lloyd. Lloyd, Lloyd Smith. Lloyd Smith. Lloyd Smith, yeah. Why did he want it not to be open until 50 years ago? Why did he want it? Why did he want 50 years to go by before they opened it? Yes. I don't know exactly why, but he, that's what he stipulated. And also... They had to build uh, a room, I understand, yeah. too, that would be able to hold uh, some of this document to preserve them. Come on down, and I'll tell you, we've got a guy down there, the Jude Fister. He'll give you the answer to that, and then some. Hey, everybody, thanks so much.